No. So nice to have you here. Good to be here. What an awesome room. And already a couple of people came up, Jeremy and Philippa Tyndale, to say hi. So I'm sure I know lots more people in the room. But great energy. So thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Philippa Tyndale is on our church board. Did yeah. you know that? She's amazing. Philippa and I, when we were talking about trekking the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Trekking the uh, Western Ghats in India about five or six years ago, Philippa was instrumental in that and, um, and it was amazing and we were raising money for Opportunity International and uh, yeah, and I then went on to speak in a, a prison and yeah, so lots and lots of things, but we haven't seen each other for a while, so hi. <laughs> do you know her husband as well? I Andrew. don't think I do, the guy in the but blue. hi Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone yeah. else want to say hi? <laughs> Sensational. Uh, so you've written books about all kinds of things. What's the one book you've written that you really felt the most passion about? Uh, look, and, and I've said to Phil, absolutely nothing is off limits today. And I mean that, like I am an open book. And... Uh, my whole mandate is that anything's possible in life. So I guess it's my first book and, and the, my most current book. So my first book was called Happiness Is and I wrote that about 10 years ago and uh, I had absolutely no idea about publishing. I had a half day publishing workshop and a half day um, self publishing workshop under my belt and I was extraordinarily unhappy, like the worst. I'd alienated my family, I was drinking too much, I was living life according to other people's expectations. And so I went on a, a search for what happiness meant, basically, and, uh, and sort of flipped the model about traditional publishing and uh, in the first 12 months um, sold 36,000 copies and the money went to Kids Helpline, which was a charity that I was really passionate about at the time. And, and that started my journey in publishing very accidentally and happily now, um, very purposefully. Incredible. <laughs> Did you, how did you get funding for that? So I've always, and I think quite a lot of people in the audience are business people, I believe. So um, I've always been kind of purposefully counterintuitive to what people expect. So I kind of looked at the traditional model, and we can talk about publishing later because I'm not sure what you've done with your 14 books. <laughs> but... Um, and I just thought at the time a bestseller in Australia was 5,000 and I was told that most books sell about 300 copies. And my real passion at the time, because I was so unhappy and I realised how much, you know, Kids Helpline and the youth of Australia needed, you know, funding and positivity. So I thought, well, bugger this, I'm going to do something a bit differently. So I actually went and pre-sold it to corporate. So I literally came up with sort of... Um, about six pages of what I thought the book would be about and some visuals and things. And then I, my frustration was I felt corporate spent so much money on inanimate objects like squeegee balls and golf umbrellas and coffee mugs. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Is this actually making any change or helping anyone in the world? So. I literally just got on the phone and started hustling and rang people like Mercedes and said, why don't you use a beautiful book all about happiness? Because it ended up having over 300 people in it, all Australians talking about what happiness meant for them. And so I convinced them to buy, I think, 2,000 copies that they used to incentivize test drives. So go along, drive a Mercedes, get given a book on happiness. Of course, everyone's going to go and talk about how fabulous Mercedes is then because, wow, we got this book. And then um, Officeworks bought 8,000 copies of the book to, as a surprise and delight. And Clinique had a perfume called Happy. So they did a, you know, spend $130 on this perfume and get a, a book of on happiness. So that was where I really started to think differently. And I think in business, <clears throat> Pardon me, my biggest lesson has been, you know, so many people write these laborious, excuse all the accountants and bankers in the room because you'll be probably shaking in your boots right now. <laughs> but, you know, people write 100 page business plans and they put all their time, effort, money, resources into it. And then they realize that there's not necessarily a market and it's this magnanimous failure. I'm the complete opposite. I come up with an idea, have absolutely no, no idea whatsoever how I'm going to do it, sell it and then work out how the hell to do it. <laughs> and it's sort of, it's a way that I can fail fast, and I do, I fail a lot, and it's about making failure my friend as opposed to my enemy, I guess, so, yeah. What would be one of you, your biggest failures? <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> oh, God, big ones. I mean, literally every day, and Jess from my team's here, she would tell me I'm, I'm kind of a crazy entrepreneur, so every day I'll come up with 
20 ideas and, you know, but I very, very quickly have to knock them on the head and iterate and change and morph and pivot and do things differently. Um, but I mean, yeah, I've written a lot of books and I, I um, you know, most people become the guru in something and then write a book. Well, I took up surfing about six years ago and, and uh, you know, I'm a bit of an instant gratification junkie. So I looked around for, you know, books on learning to surf. And at the time, there wasn't really anything. So I thought, well, why don't I write books on learning to surf? I'd been out three times, I think, at this time. <laughs> and so, you know, but, but what you were saying before, I really related to, you know, anything is possible and if you have a belief. And at the time, um, you know, there was a lot of cute boys surfing and I thought, well, I need to take this up clearly. And so I just went out and asked the question and I, I Googled, you know, who's the best surfer in Australia? And I found this guy, Barton Lynch, I had no idea at the time, you know, six-time world champion surfer or whatever um, I just found his number rang him he said I'm in Hawaii at the moment I mean this is just about believing in yourself you know and he and I ran this idea by him I said I want to do this book on learning to surf and you know finding the best people and pulling together the cancer council and um, surfing Australia and all these other people and he said I love the idea anyway he said I'll be back in Australia in three weeks and uh, because it's not about, it. for me it was just that ex external validation, you know, we have to believe in ourselves but sometimes it just takes one person to say yes and then you're accountable to someone bigger than yourself. So he got back three weeks later and, um, and I'd pretty much, you know, already started pre-selling but they ended up being a little bit of a failure because the model wasn't quite right but anyway, I'll send you some because I, I have plenty left. <laughs> Anyone else want to learn to surf? <laughs> yeah, well, Missy, but you've got to try, you know. You do, you do, you do. So, what would be one of the most difficult situations you have managed to overcome? So, well, personally or business-wise, I can give you many of both. <laughs> <laughs> uh, personally. So, personally, I think. Um, so, I, I mentioned before when I wrote Happiness Is, and I was incredibly unhappy. And I think people look, and we can maybe get a bit more into my story as to where I'm at now, because it's a very different place to where I was then. But um, I think it's really important to remember from where we came. So, I mentioned that I really had no semblance of who I was. I hadn't found any kind of faith or you know anything bigger than me. Um, I was really lost and so I was drinking a lot and using that as a crutch. Um, I alienated myself from my family. I literally didn't speak to my mother, sister or father for three years. Um, married a guy that I got engaged to within 10 days. None of my family came to the wedding. You know, it didn't last very long. Like it was this just crane, train smash, train smash, train smash. And, uh, you know, and then I had, a dis I had to make a decision because I was going through a lot of depression and suicidal thoughts. Sorry, you wanted the personal thing. Jeez, <laughs> everyone, gra grab a seat. But <laughs> it gets better, let me tell you. But the point around it is that, you know, people look at me now and go, oh, you're so confident and oh, you've got so much self-belief and you're so fearless and I am every single one of those things absolutely unequivocally which is why I'm very happy to talk about all of this but I had to make a very conscious conscious decision back then you know do I choose life essentially or do I just you know choose whatever else there was and um and and I chose life very very specifically on that day which was um which was November the 8th, 2004. And I gave up drinking on that day. Now, I have more champagne in my fridge than anyone I know, so it's not about that. <laughs> but I personally chose that. And I think what's important is that we all have some kind of self-sabotage or something that's holding us back or something we use as a crutch. And for me, that was just what it was for me personally. And, uh, and you know, and people often say to me, now you're always so happy. And I absolutely make no apology for that because that was a very conscious decision to live my life on purpose and find very much what I was here for and turn my life around. So, um, you know, and it, it's a really nice position to be in. I'm extraordinarily grateful every day for the dark um, place that I went to and you know that that hitting rock bottom for such a long period of time because it's only from that place that I now feel I can actually you know have a platform to truly help other people because I know what it's like I've been there I didn't just kind of like you know things just happen and it was all amazing so yeah so that's <laughs> awesome and I think uh, I often you say how can I help others and a lot of your motivation seems to be like you're going to uh, network with the cancer council because that's going to help other people in terms of thinking about them. That, 
That, uh, are you aware that that is part of your motivation, that how we can make the planet a better place? You said that a little earlier on as well. Yeah, I think so. And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about the collective. I don't know if you want me to talk about that now um, in terms of... So uh, for those of you... Who knows the collective magazine? Qu quite a few. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I get equally as excited when people know about it because I think wow that's awesome and I get equally as excited when people don't because I think we've got so much more work to do and I think that's anything in life you know there's always two sides um, but yeah for me so I uh, after you know giving up the drinking and everything else I kind of went on 10 years of um, real personal development which you know included going to Costa Rica to some very communal showers <laughs> I would not recommend <laughs> and uh, and and lots and lots of different sort of things all over the world. And, um, and, so, and so I kind of, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I sort of got a bit bored of working on myself and I thought I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin now. And it's really time to give back, you know. And, and a lot of what you said I really related to. I was like, oh, yeah, tick, tick. Oh, everything was amazing. Um, but for me, I just saw so much negativity in the world and um, particularly in the media, you know. We're constantly fed with just hideous things and I've, I, I hardly ever watch the news to be honest and you can call that naive or you can call that damn sensible <laughs> um, because I mean I watched it the other day and it was literally you know someone had died someone had been raped someone was this someone was that and then and it was kind of like well what's that doing to me and what does that make us feel like every day and I was um, you know in the since I've started you know writing books and working with a number of inspirational extraordinary people I just thought I want to feed you know something inspirational and aspirational and the story behind the story not just the spin and hype that the traditional media puts out there you know I want to tell the real story what happens how do people become successful or how do they get where they're going or what are the hardships and all of that kind of thing and and so in a time when people were saying you know magazines were dead and print was dying and I had never worked for a magazine in my life and at the time two years ago I had three staff but coming back to what you said when you believe in every single cell in your body this is your purpose and this is your why and you know I prayed for about four years because I had got comfortable in terms of my previous business which was marketing and essentially content creation and I don't believe comfortable really is a good place to be like I I, I just kept saying over and over again to the universe God I kept saying um, you know what is my purpose and it's a really interesting thing I got to a point of complete surrender and that means I had complete detachment from outcome and that's unlike anything I've ever felt before and it just fell in so clearly that I needed to produce you know something through a medium which happened to be print and it's since turned into about 18 different platforms because I actually believe the mediums are relevant. It's very much around how can I deliver a message to people in a positive way that absolutely anything is possible, that you can do whatever it is that you want to do on this planet. And I absolutely believe that in every cell of my body now. And so the collective was born and um, it's incredible when you are so on purpose. You know, I started literally with no money, I mean a bit of money from my previous business, um, no staff who knew anything about magazines including myself and books are very different, they're quite one dimensional in comparison and, uh, and the, the synchronicity <coughs> and the serendipity and the people that you attract and what opens up and what happens as a result of that is honestly unlike anything I have ever experienced or seen. And I think it's because I completely was detached from the outcome. I removed myself in terms of ego. It's not about me. I say I'm purely the conduit and, and I'm the architect. But I think because it's um, so positive and because it's, you know, there's so much integrity behind it, um, I don't know, you guys can tell me, whoever reads it, <laughs> you probably have a much better idea than I do. But it's, um, it's working and the print magazine's now in 37 countries, which is pretty extraordinary. <laughs> wow. And how long has that taken? Uh, if on the 4th of March, it will be two years since we launched. That's all. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> how often do you put it out? Monthly. So it, how many pages did it have when you, your first edition? Uh, it had 176. It still has 176. And uh, it will only go up, not down. <clears throat> and it's interesting because it defies all logic. 
Um, Matthew Stanton, who was until recently the CEO of Bauer, I had no idea who Bauer even was when I launched, <laughs> but um, they have over 80 magazines in this country alone and in Australia there's over 5,500 print magazines. Um, we're currently sitting consistently in the top 10 and, uh, and Matthew used to sit down with me every three months or so and just shake his head at me and it was lovely that he sort of took me under his wing a little bit. And he just said to me, how on earth are you doing this? Because the thing is, they have millions and millions of dollars behind them. They have thousands and thousands of staff who actually know what they're doing. <laughs> and what I believe is that it's not, um, it's not the big that eat the small, it's the fast that eat the slow. When you're nimble and flexible and you've got the ability to move and adapt and change, you know, we could say, and I was listening to you and my brain goes, tick, 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 what can we do together? Because how amazing and what a great community. But, you know, we can have a conversation straight after this and... and <laughs> <laughs> I'm using it as an example, but don't worry, I will. I am a hustler. And, uh, but, you know, like, we, we have the ability to say, oh, well, let's do blah, blah, blah next week. Whereas, and I often use this as an example, someone like Justine Cullen, who is the um, editor of Elle magazine in this country, and she's amazing, gorgeous girl. But there are 43, I think, other Elles around the world. So for her to even change a font or say, I'd like to do an article next month on, you know, this amazing community, it's got to go through the publisher. And, you know, there's so many layers of bureaucracy and then it's got to go to Italy for approval. And so... It's quite fun. Our next cover that comes out on Monday, and this is how <laughs> this is how sort of detached I am. I mean, everything we have certain systems and processes and all of that kind of thing because we need to because of the magnitude of the business now. But um, I walked into the back room the other day just as we were going to print, and the nine girl said, "Oh, I pushed the wrong button." I'm sure she didn't. Like that's a bit. I'm playing it down. I've got no idea about the technical side of design. And she said the cover was pink. It's now peach. And I went, "Oh." Peach looks good. We haven't done peach before. Just go. But I mean, that, that's just, you know, and it looks great, I have to say. But, um, you know, people would die when there's so much bureaucracy. And I'm sure many of you who work for big corporates can relate to that. But we've got that flexibility and we can be nimble. And, and does it really matter? Is someone going to die if it's peach or pink? No. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. What's the biggest difficulty you've met in, uh, in your business world? Uh, I think one of the biggest difficulties is finance, but it's how, and you mentioned this before, it, I think everything always has a flip side and it's how you look at it. And so, you know, I have, call it blind faith, but I truly believe in something much bigger than me. And, uh, and I have a funny story because my um, accountant, uh, about six months into the birth of the magazine, just sat there getting redder and redder as he pumped his fist at a redder and redder bottom line. <laughs> and I ended up having to break up with my accountant for about four months because he just said to me, there is no way you can make this happen. And I just sat there saying, it's okay, Greg, it's going to be fine. <laughs> but, um, but that's really about, and I mean, many of you will be able to relate to that. It's about, you know, believing in something much bigger than us. And I, and I think that, you know, I, I can't quite explain that. You can probably explain that much more than me. But, um, but it's, you, you know, you have to have that belief. Uh, the print magazine alone in Australia, and that's not the other 36 countries it goes into, just the print magazine costs me now $350,000 a month to put out. We have 18 other um, revenue streams and sort of business units around that from web to events to my books to all sorts of other stuff um, because we have to. And so it's kind of like running 18 startups within two years. It is the maddest way to run a business. I do not recommend it. <laughs> you know, business is all about precision focus, but the reality is to be able to move this fast and get and make this happen and, you know, and know, and, and know what my purpose is and know my, what my why is. And people say to me, why, what make, how do you get out of bed every day? You know, being an entrepreneur is hard. My answer to that is I get between six and 800 emails every single day now. Some of those are spam, but the majority are people saying the collective has touched us. You know, I started my business. Um, yeah, e extraordinary things. And uh, actually, can I tell a very quick little story? Please. So um, this is a woman has, this is a very personal story and I talk about it in my next editor's letter, but there is a woman who has worked with me once a week for the last four years. And uh, there's so many things we don't know about people and I think this is important for any of us to remember. Um, she came to me two weeks ago and she said to me, I need to tell you a story. And I said, 
yes. And she said, um, for six months I had planned to commit suicide. I knew nothing of this. You know, to me, she comes in to my office once a week. She is the happiest person. She's bubbly. She has helped me so much in business. And I said, oh, my God. And I had given her a copy of my book, Daring and Disruptive. And uh, anyway, she said to me she'd, she'd planned to commit suicide on Christmas Day. Sorry, it's not a very happy story, but it is now. And she said to me, I felt really rude to go until I'd read your book because you'd gifted it to me. I'm thinking, oh, my God. Anyway, she said to me, I read it and I changed my entire thinking in an instant. She said, I've written my bucket list. This is what I'm doing. She's chronically ill. She's got a massive leg issue. And she said, I've decided to run this 134 kilometer marathon. And so I'm going to run some of it with her. And anyway, she has just had this complete turnaround. And that isn't about me and it's not about my book. It's about all of us, you know. It's about... Often this, I, I mean, I think I'm fairly intuitive, but this woman sat in front of me for four years once a week and I had no idea the place she was in, you know? And I think for all of us, when we think, what is our purpose, why are we here? You probably have no idea how many people you're touching, you know? And so that's a really important message, I think, to just keep going. And if you ever wonder, gosh, it's really tough, or why should I keep going? Well, just think about how many people, by you being yourself and being positive and showing that anything's possible, or whatever it is that you do on a daily basis, it has such an impact on people without you even knowing. Exactly. Now, you've, uh, you've obviously influenced a lot of young ladies, a lot of other people. Who's influenced you? Ah, so many people. And uh, it's an interesting, thank you. It's a really interesting question, Phil, because I think people expect me to say, you know, um, you know, Michelle Obama and Martha Stewart and, you know, Sheryl Sandberg and all these amazing people. And, and certainly, uh, and, you know, for me, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, Nelson Mandela, you know, all those sorts of people. But the reality around that is that I only know, uh, you know, the, the PR and the hype or the, the thing that surrounds them. Although I did spend four and a half days on Richard Branson's Necker Island in November with him, so I now know him. Tick. <laughs> I just I love a little name drop. <laughs> um, but so I think what's really important as well, the biggest lesson for me around that is, you know. Um, I can aspire to be the person that I think they are. And I think that's something very valid to be able to do. But, um, but who inspires me on a, you know, more closely on a daily basis, to be honest, is now our readers and our community. Because honestly, through all the emails I get, and, um, and yesterday alone I got, I think, five different products or something that people sent me um, who'd started their own businesses. And they write me these beautiful handwritten notes saying, I, you know, I was too scared, I was fearful, I didn't have the confidence, and I've read the collective, and I read these stories or whatever, and so it gave me the impetus to start it. And here's my thing. I've had so many people make me, oh, it just it makes me really emotional, but pieces of jewellery where they'll, like, car, hand carve, you know, daring and disruptive on it, and one woman read the collective and wanted to have a jewellery business and she said she got to issue three and she flew to Hong Kong and went to the jewellery fair and then she lives in Melbourne and she flew up from Melbourne and came to one of our events and had made this necklace for me and she said it's my first ever piece of jewellery I've made. So it's those people who are closer to home that I just think are being so courageous on a daily basis and, you know, getting out of their comfort zone. So they're the people that I, you know, that inspire me. Brilliant. What's the future for Lisa Messenger, the collective and entire organization the future for me is um i am an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs my life's work i know absolutely now is to just you know inspire others and and uh by doing that i just need to open and authentic and be myself and take people on the journey of the highs and the lows which is hard because it's you know becoming more and more public but um but I'm sort of detached from that now and you know whatever it takes to just say because I know where I came from and I know how crap I was and I was you know born seven hours northwest of Sydney like I you know there's nothing special and so I feel like that is my purpose now and with the collective it's kind of an extension of that just to um, continue to show people anything's possible and if you believe it and you dream it 
and you chase it, then you can have absolutely anything, you know. There's a silly thing going around on Instagram at the moment, you know, that says um, we have as many hours in the day as Beyonce. Well, who cares? But we, <laughs> but I mean, we seriously have as many hours in the day as anyone else, you know, and it's just how much you're prepared to, um, yeah, believe in yourself unwaveringly and surround yourself with amazing people and then just go for it, you know. I think it's, it's our own... We get in our own way. It's our own fear or sabotage or um, feelings of inadequacy or whatever it is. And so you've just got to be brave enough to, you know, overcome that. You know, uh, Lisa, one of the, uh, the things I've seen happen with people who have a similar story, it, n not as big as yours, but, you know, they've gone from rags to riches or they've gone from a difficult background to a more simple lifestyle. In the success, they're, they've found themselves with a whole new set of problems than the ones they used to have. Sometimes even more difficult pressures to, to get through uh, that affect their home life, that affect their health, that affect their mental life. And so have, have you struck any new kind of pressures that yes. you, you, you are needing to discover new skills to cope with all that? Yeah, it's such a good question. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, the, it, it, it's funny. I think as things get bigger in life, and you see it a lot with, um, you know, athletes or actors or whoever, people who have overnight success or success over long periods of time, I think there's one of two ways you can go. You know, people can become extremely egotistical and arrogant and surround themselves with a whole lot of yes people and, you know, can turn to drugs and there can be all sorts of other things that go on. Or you know, you can choose to remain humble and grounded. And I think for me, it's very much about remembering my why and my purpose and that it's not about me and that it's, you know, and, and I think as, and I often say to all my team and anyone who's around me, you know, if, if anything, uh, if I ever get, of course, we ha all have some ego, but if, I, if I'm not aware of it or I'm not conscious of it, then, you know, slap me very hard because I do not de deserve to be in the position I'm in. The other thing around that is, yes, of course, I mean, now the collective print magazines in 37 countries and, um, I, you know, I could, I could sit here for about three hours listing the different um, touch points and the, the magnitude and the logistics and everything else that's going on now is huge. Um, but the funny thing about that is I tend to get karma as I go because you have to and so I have a number of tools and rituals and continue to do you know work on myself and um, you know have personal development I love listening to you before because I think we never stop learning and that's the most important thing you know we're never bigger than that and I need to continue to develop to develop that and there's certain not negotiables in my life now and sometimes it shocks people when I say um, my number one priority is my health over and above everything else, over and above work, over and above relationships, because without my health, I have nothing, you know? Like, I can't be a good boss, I can't be a good partner, I can't be a good leader. And so, you know, I have a personal trainer three times a week. Every single morning I drink a green juice, you know, then if I have hot chips for lunch, well, who cares, no. <laughs> but it's, you know, there are certain things, um, at, in our office we have a lot of plants my dog Benny comes to work every day and so it's about just finding those moments of solace and quiet rather than just running like a mad woman continuously I am fairly mad Jess will attest to but um so I be out on the deck, you know, with a secateurs, just chopping a few branches, <laughs> even if it takes a minute, just to shift my mindset and, and have some calm and just, you know, have a little meditation for a minute because um, it's only going to get crazier. And the reality is we have no control really about what is thrown at us on a daily basis, you know. And so all we can have is the tools and the tenacity and, you know, the self-belief and the knowing within ourselves so that when these things come, and they do, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, you would know this better than anyone, um, you know, we have, we have that inner peace to call on. Sure. Do you uh, see, like, in your, in your network of fellows, other publishers and people like yourself, do you, do you have uh, advice that they have given you that you've been able to implement, or have you found it all being completely your own disruptive, daring uh, exercise? Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, I didn't go really near another publisher <clears throat> for at least 18 months of the uh, 
you know, of the magazine's inception, which again is very counterintuitive, but I, I'm a big believer, you know, if an industry is falling over and they're doing things the way that, that it's always been done, sometimes it's better to look outside that industry and, uh, you know, and and also I think we really overcomplicate business. Like I'm a massive believer in that. You know, people said to me so many times, oh, you can't do that. I was like, really? And the only way, the reason the collective is working is because I literally thought, I'm an entrepreneur, what would I want to read? I'm a positive person, what would I want to read? I'm sick of reading about, you know, such and such wears this and such. I can't stand, I couldn't care less about fashion, quite frankly. Shh. <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't re that doesn't make the world go round. So I like to look at, you know, the deeper things. What is the story behind that? And, um, and so, and, and then, you know, traditional publishers, their model is they sell a flat ad on a page. Well, I'm much more about how can we engage an entire community and do much more exciting things. So I looked very differently and then I thought, well, and where would I want to pick up a magazine? And so, you know, we went into newsstand, but then I just started bringing the lounges. So we're in all Qantas, Emirates, Virgin lounges. We're in all Coles and Woolworths stores. And But, you know, every now and again I'd hear, oh, you can't, no one goes into a Woolworths store until they've been in market for at least 10 years. Well, we went in within the first three months. So, but but it's not because of anything other than I picked up the phone. And, um, and, and it was funny, I had a little story. When we were going into the Qantas, to have the meeting to get into the Qantas lounge and our distributor said to my marketing director, they're in such a panic and they said, what are you taking into Qantas? Like, what, what's her presentation materials? And Claire said, Lisa? <laughs> and, um, and I don't say that to be funny, a little bit funny, but, but, um, <laughs> but the reason around that is I think so often we rely on, you know, all these tools and presentations and complex materials and if you just speak from the heart and you're passionate about something and you really believe in it, then it is quite extraordinary how many people will back you. And uh, yeah, anyway, I could go on and on and oh, on about that. That's <laughs> fantastic. You know, I, th I think uh, the, the, the most notable thing is that you, you got started. You picked up the phone, you pre-sold the magazine, you rang Macquarie Bank and Mercedes Benz, and you made them listen to a, a good. And women are always better salespeople than men. Uh, well, not in Tim Foote's office, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I read a uh, a, a little uh, article this morning that said, in the year 2020, 80 percent of the businesses that'll be in the top S&P 500 companies in America at this time do not exist. 80% of those businesses do not yet exist. So there's so much opportunity for especially us young people. <laughs> what are you laughing about? You used to be so kind and uh, you've changed. You know, uh, but... <laughs> you are so yeah. young. Look at you. Please. You could be a day over 20. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. One friend here this morning. Amazing. Well, thanks, Lisa, for being with us. It's uh, been such a delight and a pleasure to meet you and to hear from you, and uh, I'm sure that we all feel much the same. So can we say thank you to Lisa? Thank you.